few minutes ago, we were singing a song entitled Every Breath. Were you paying attention to the words in that song? I just want to read a couple of the words here. Let every breath I breathe pour out in praise towards the King. Jesus, forever true, my every breath will worship you. It's nice words. But is that how you feel about Jesus right now? Listen to those words again. Every breath I breathe, pour out in praise towards the King. Jesus, forever true, my every breath will worship you. Well, I suppose in one sense, uh, whenever we're doing poetry or, or songs or something, there's always some degree of hyperbole in the process of it. And in some ways, it's an aspirational kind of concept. But how far short of this reality does your reality really come right now? This is obviously a weird time. So, so the worship team is is in the worship room and they play the music and there's this powerful experience. And often there's that very powerful experience when you're in the room with them. But what have you been doing for worship during this time? Maybe you've tuned in every week, but are you singing the songs? Are you engaging in the worship experience? Are you letting the words happen to you? Or, or do they just sound good? It's just kind of background music. You got it going in the background. I know my own experience during this time, watching the different services and engaging, it's easy to get distracted at home, isn't it? When you're in, you're in the worship room, there's just the song, it's just you, you're focused there with the people around you. At home, maybe you get up, maybe you go in the other room. The words of this song, Later on, it says, how great is the one who breathes life into dry bones. How are your bones right now? Is it a little dry? Heaven exhales and my soul is revived. How great is the one whose hope lines the horizon. Just when it feels like the end, there is new life. How great is the one who brushed death off our shoulders. Victory came when he took back the night. The heart of our Savior deserving all praises, my hallelujah will echo through time. I want us to reflect on our heart attitude today, our heart attitude toward Jesus. And I want us to ask ourselves two questions. Number one, am I as committed to Jesus as these songs imply? Number two, do I love Jesus the way these songs describe? Am I as committed as these songs imply? And do I really love Jesus like this, that, that every breath I breathe would be poured out as praise towards the King? Is that true for you? I want to talk to you today from a few texts and a few thoughts and a few other words from the songs today. And I want to challenge your heart. Are we living with love towards Jesus? Is our, is our mind and our heart in union, in commitment to the Lord Jesus? For this really to be true, we, we need to at least review the reason why that would be the case. And I want to start in John chapter 20. Uh, verse beginning in verse 30, and I'm reading from the New King James Version today. John chapter 20, verse 30. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is a very profound statement. It's not all that often that the Bible writer gives you the specific reason why they wrote the book. But John gives us the reason. The reason I wrote this gospel, the book of John, is so that anyone reading it would believe two things. Jesus is the Christ and Jesus is the Son of God. 
And that the net result of that belief, that head and heart experience creating a belief, would be that the one who believes would have life in his name. I want to look at that because the songs that we have sung today and the songs that remain really key on this reality that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing we have life in his name. So, so let's, let's talk about that. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. These are important concepts. These are the reasons that John believed his book needed to be written. Let's talk first about... Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. What does that mean? Well, Christ and Messiah, they're the same word. It's just Christ is from a Greek word, Christos, and Messiah is a Hebrew word. But they both mean the same thing. They mean the anointed one. Well, what does that mean? We don't really anoint things like we used to, uh, like, like those who lived before us did. Well, maybe a better way for us to say it is it means the chosen one. The one set apart for a purpose. And the key to being able to truly worship with a, with a heart of fullness toward Jesus is, is one part of it is to understand he is the chosen one. He is the one set aside for a purpose. Well, what was that purpose? I take you to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 32. It says, now they were on the road and this is Jesus and his disciples, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. But he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. This is what it meant to be the chosen one. Jesus was chosen for this. And, and the disciples are amazed because Jesus has set his face for Jerusalem. And he has said, I'm going there. And it's going to go badly. Or at least you're going to believe it's gone badly. Because a really hard thing is going to happen. But what they don't understand yet, and what, what we struggle to understand, is it is exactly for this reason that Jesus came. Hebrews chapter 10. Beginning reading in verse 5. Therefore, when he, speaking of Jesus, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings, and offering for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. Verse 10, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What is this telling us? This passage is quoting. It's quoting from the Old Testament. It's actually quoting from Psalm 40. And the author of Hebrews is saying, when Jesus came into the world, he said, look, Father, all of these sacrifices that you gave the people, all the things that they were doing were to point towards something. I am the thing that it's pointing toward, Jesus said. It's pointing to me. You gave me a body. I will give this life that the sins of the people can be forgiven. That they, might be sacrificed, that they might be sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This is what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah, the chosen one. We are made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus in our place. He died that we might live 
and love and be free. But here's the thing. There could, there could only be one chosen one. And as it turns out, we were not going to be able to help. Another prophecy from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 63. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone and from the peoples no one was with me. This is a prophecy about Jesus. And it was hard to understand until the fullness of what Jesus would do had taken place. And why were his garments red? Because he, he stamped out the vintage by himself. He died alone. Verse 5 of this prophecy. I looked, but there was no one to help. And I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me and my own fury, it sustained me. Jesus did it alone. Because he wanted to? No, he didn't want to, but he did it alone because he had to. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. So here is Jesus, just before he's about to fulfill this prophecy in Isaiah and so many other prophecies. He's about to, to tread the wine press alone. He's about to go where no one else can go. And he pleads with the humans with him. Please, stay with me, watch and pray. Verse 39, he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour. It's a tragic story, but it was what the chosen one was going to have to go through for us, and we couldn't help. We didn't help. We couldn't help. Jesus had to save us all by himself. We started with another song today. It's called See the Light. The words went like this. Arise, my soul, remember this. He took my sin and he buried it. No longer I who live, now Jesus lives in me. For I was dead in sin, but I woke up to see the light. No, I won't boast, but in the cross that saved my soul, all else is lost. The grip of fear has no hold on me, so where, O oh death, is your sting? No longer I who live, now Jesus lives in me, for I was dead in sin, but I woke up to see the light. And then the chorus we sang, all, all of this for your glory. For the glory of Jesus. You see, we, we love and we live and we give our lives for Jesus' glory because he was the one appointed to die for our sins. And when he could have turned back, out of love for us, he gave his all. This is Jesus, the chosen one. John wrote his book so that we could understand this. But he also said he is the Son of God. And I want to talk about that too for a minute here. So we'll go over to Galatians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, 
born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has set, sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Only God's son was able to save us. And God sent him forth. And the result of his work is he made us the sons and daughters of God. And God sends out his spirit which enables us to cry out in worship. There's another very powerful passage about Jesus, and it's in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. It says, Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, saying Jesus and the Father were of the same reality. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. So what this means is Jesus left all of that, all of the glory, and took on the form of humans. Verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So you see Jesus come down from his glory to be like us. But not he didn't stop there. He went on to die condemned on a cross. Now watch what happens. Verse 9, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the worship that should pour out of us. Jesus became a man. He died even though he was of the very nature of God. Then he rose again, and God exalted him for his faithfulness, for his victory, and gave Jesus the name above every name, that every knee should bow in worship, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And this is where we were going with that song, Tremble, that we sang did you listen to the words? Peace, bringing it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break at your name. Because his is the name above every other name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Why? Because it's become the name above every name. And then the song went on and it said these words, Breathe, then call these bones to live. Call these lungs to sing. Once again I will praise. It's the praise mandate that, er that the name of Jesus all should praise. Also these words in that song, your name is a light that the shadows can't, can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Jesus, given the name above every name. We sang these songs. We have borne this witness but were we truly doing it with our heart and with our mind and with a fullness of understanding? Because that is the worship that the Father seeks from us. John wrote his book so that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. I think we can agree that Jesus does not get the praise he deserves on this earth. And sadly, I think we would have to admit that even among those of us 
who have the most reason to praise him, he does not get the praise he deserves. So let me ask you, how well did you praise Jesus today? Did you have a private time where you gave praise? Did you have a prayer time where you gave praise? Did you join in the corporate praise? There is one place in the Bible where Jesus does get the praise he deserves. And, and I want to show it to you as an example. Both as something to us, for us to aspire towards and, and as a rebuke of our reality of how little praise we give. And it's Revelation chapter 5. It goes like this. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, this is the Ancient of Days, this is the Father, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David is prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. We're talking about Jesus now. Verse six, and I looked. And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, there stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Who was the lamb that was slain? It's Jesus. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now I want, I want you to watch this worship. I want you to imagine this. Now when he, Jesus, had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, those were, were cherubim around the throne of God, and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Every knee shall bow. Fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Why did they say he's worthy of praise? Because he was victorious and because he made all of those who had no right to the access to God and to heaven. He made them not just forgiven, but now he's made them kings and priests to God, redeemed. But that's not the end of the worship. Verse 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Now, angels, if, if there was just one that were to appear to you, based on the testimony of scripture, what would happen to you is you would fall down on the ground as though dead. So here we have not just one of those amazing beings, we have thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 of these amazing beings gathered around. And what do they say? Here's what they say. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. They're talking about Jesus. They're worshiping Jesus. But it goes on. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Is that the kind of worship that is in your heart today? One more text. Galatians 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me 
and I to the world. What are you boasting in? These, these words were in, in, in the song, See the Light. It says, no, I won't boast, but in the cross that saved my soul, all else is lost. Are you boasting in what Jesus has done for you? And worshiping the one? I want to revisit those questions we started with, and here it is. Am I as committed to Jesus as I should be? And the second, do I love Jesus as I ought to love him? We're about to sing another song. This one's called Worthy. And you heard how the songs they sang around the throne of God was about how he is worthy. I want you to hear these words, so this is in your head. It was my cross you bore, so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours, and I will sing of your goodness forevermore. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. And now my shame is gone. I stand amazed at your love undeniable. Your grace goes on and on. And I will sing of your goodness forevermore. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. Or shall we say these places since we're not together. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the name above all names. Let's give him the praise he deserves.